Uh, we started a series here last week on, uh, so what if Jesus asked you? I mean, what if, what if it were Jesus asking you the questions he asked in the Gospels? And uh, last time, you know, we looked at, uh, he asked the question, do you really believe me? That was the question we looked at. Today I want to look at, focus at the question that Jesus asked. He says here, what about your soul? Well, we sang some songs about the soul, but what about your soul? In fact, the way he actually puts it in the gospel is like this. He asks, what good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world and yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? Now, I thought it was probably a pretty good question to ask ourselves to begin with. It's just simply this, what is a soul? <laughs> I mean, are we assuming that everyone knows what a soul is? In fact, so I've given it a little definition here. It's the immaterial part of man that is vitally connected to the body and makes that person alive. All right? It's that immaterial part, the you, the you, okay? So as such, if you got this immaterial part, as such, your soul is alive. Your soul is alive. The soul is not dead, it's alive. It's a living entity. The, the second thing I notice is your soul is invisible. You can't see it. I can't see your soul. That's why I put this little ghost from Pac-Man up there. <laughs> You remember playing Pac-Man, you gobbled up, and then the, the little soul went back to the, on the home station? Uh, well, I didn't know how to depict the soul, so I'm sure he doesn't look like that. My soul doesn't look like that, but, but because it's invisible, you can't see your soul. It's invisible. The next thing is your soul is vitally connected to your body. So my soul is connected to my body. It's not connected to yours. Yours is not connected to me. All right? It, it, it is your soul, and I have my soul, and they're not to be confused or mixed up, we, but we all have a soul. But because it's vitally connected to the body, it may cause a psychosomatic illness. All right? My soul, okay, my psyche, can make my body sick. If in my soul I'm a worry wart, I, I can cause myself to have some ulcers. See what I'm saying? A psychosomatic illness. It's vitally connected. I believe the reverse is true too. My bodily sickness, when I get run down, can make me very depressed. It can make me very depressed. Something in my body can trigger me to be really angry. Like when a guy cuts me off and I want to respond to him. Okay, something in my body... Makes, makes me inside get really uptight and angry. We all have the soul. That's what we're defining. Here, this is what the soul is. It's the invisible you. It's your ego, the I. That's what ego means, I. I. It's, it's me. It's the self inside the body. And we all have one. That's what the soul is. That's what the soul is. So where did the soul come from? That's a good question. Where did the soul come from? Well, in the book of Genesis, chapter 2, when God was creating man, it says, And the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. This is where it occurs, first time, living soul. Where did it come from? God gave it to you. Now, now the evolutionists and the scientists have no idea where your soul come from. They're totally clueless on this. Now, I say that even though, even though they have a science that is dedicated to your soul. Do you know that? They have a science totally dedicated to your soul. This science is called psychology. And it's probably the most popular major on college campuses today. Everybody wants to be a psych major for some reason. Well, you know what? The word soul in the Hebrew is nefesh, nefesh. It's translated in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament that is often quoted in the New Testament as opposed to the Hebrew. It's translated by the word suke, and if I were to transliterate that into the English, it's psyche, psyche. We get this whole thing called psychology. The ology means study of, psyche means your soul. It's the study of your soul. But what the secularist means by that is simply the study of your behavior. 
why do you behave in your body the way you do? And we know why, because you're a living soul. God gave you something on the inside. There is a you inside of that body. You have a soul. You have a psyche. That's, where did it come from? God gave it to you. That's what the text says. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. That's the body, the shell. That's what I'm in. And he breathed into his nostrils a blast of wind. One, one preacher called it the holy wind of God. He, he breathed into that, that dust a life-giving force, and man became a living soul. So you take a bunch of, of, of uh, material from the earth, the dust, and in your science you put it all together, you take all the chemical compounds and you, you assemble them all together and you lay it out and you shape it out and it looks like a man. Guess what? It's still dead. I am more than just chemicals and material. I have a living soul sparked by God. That's where it came from. God infused with a holy breath the, within the body that part of you that is you, the soul. You are a living soul. You are a living soul. So what happens when the soul leaves? That's a good question. When the soul is absent, you are dead. The body is dead. Your soul is not dead. Your soul has just been removed. Uh, watch what the text says. In James chapter 2, James is trying to distinguish between a person who has real faith and a person who doesn't have real faith. And he says this, as the body without the spirit, the immaterial part, is dead. There's a definition of what death is. Death occurs when the immaterial part of man separates from his material part, the body dies. Because he says, so faith without works is dead. If you, do, if, you're, if you just say, profess your faith, but are you not really living your faith, then you have a fake, you have a dead faith, a dead faith. And he's saying if a body doesn't have the immaterial part in it, it is dead. Now, so often, the, 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 the immaterial part, the soul of a person, like in a car accident, I don't know if it takes off just before the accident happens, <laughs> like, I'm getting out of here before I get crushed. Or once it gets crushed, it says, I'm leaving this crushed body, okay? But death occurs when that immaterial part, the soul, leaves the body. If the soul lingers on in that crushed body and it waits for that body to get well, the soul is revived as well because there's a connection, there's a vital connection between the two. But when your soul leaves your body, the body dies. As you, uh, it says, God says to, to, to Adam when he created him, he's saying, you return to the ground when you die. Since from it you were taken, dust you are, and to dust you will return. One day every one of our bodies is going to be either lying in a casket or in a fire furnace in order to make a bunch of ashes, or you're going to be lost at sea and swallowed up, your body is going to be gone. Your body's going to be gone. But the soul, the soul will, re will remain. It will remain. As dust returns to the ground, Solomon says, from which it came, the spirit returns to God who gave it. Every single one of us is going to return to the very presence of God and give an account of what we have done in our bodies. That that gives an account is your soul. It's you, the person inside, the person deep inside. So the question becomes this, is the soul the same as the spirit? Because both words are used. It's like in English, we have the word spirit, and we also have the word ghost, and they mean the same thing. The old King James Version referred to the Holy Ghost. But when the ghost took on a different nuance of meaning, you know, like Casper the Friendly Ghost, and, and uh, 
it kind of took on the wrong direction of meaning, ghouls and goblin ghosts. Uh, the, the, the dominant term became a little more sacred and, 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 and was the term spirit. And so, because they mean the same thing. But, so the question is, is soul and spirit, are they the same or are they different? Well, this has led theologians to try to figure this out. And some are what are called trichotomists, by the word tri, you see it on there. Cotomous parts, three parts. You, does they say you have three parts? And, and what they do is they go to a passage like uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.23, and they say, here, look, it, it defines, it speaks about your whole spirit, your whole soul, and your whole body. This is, this is you. You're made up of three parts. And so there are a lot of people who believe that, hey, I believe in trichotomy. There's three parts. You have a body, soul, and spirit. And the spirit and the soul are two distinct parts. But there's just a small problem with this. And the small problem is this. In another place, Jesus said something like this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Well, wait a minute. Now i got another part. It's called a heart. He's not talking about the organ inside pumping blood because he's talking about love. It's not my heart inside that makes my love. It's an immaterial psychological term, a soulish term. I have a heart. Now, in the Semitic mind, you thought with your heart, not with your head. I know that from the book of Genesis. All right. By the time we get to the New Testament, it's more you, you, th you, 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 you feel from your heart and you think from your mind. And so he says, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Now i got another immaterial part. I put a brain up there, but we don't know where you are really thinking. We know that's where the storage of all the information is. But where are you really at? And then there's another one. It's called your conscience. I have a conscience. You have a conscience. Your conscience is a moral thing. It, it, your conscience makes judgments about what you think, what you feel, and what you do in your body, whether they are good or bad. So now i got a conscience, and my conscience says, uh, Dennis, what you did was really bad. But my conscience also says, it wasn't as bad as your brother Eddie. <laughs> all right? And so now it either accuses me or it excuses me. All right? See what it does? That's my conscience. It's another part of me. And so I am of the opinion that we got a lot of different parts. I didn't even put up there the will. Where's, where's my will take place at? What part of me makes choices? I, I decide and choose. It's another part. The Bible also has an expression called the bowels of compassion. Now all of a sudden it's deep down in here, those feelings, they come so deep and low that, that you get you a, a gut ache from those feelings. You see, why? Why is this immaterial part of me so attached to my body that it's having an impact on my body? There's all these terms. So there's another school of thought that you are actually a dichotomist. And by dichotomist, it means that you have two parts. You fundamentally have a material part. I have a body. It has feet. It has legs. i got hands, fingers, toes. I, I have eyes, ears. I, I have hair. And I have more hair than some. I have less than others. But I have all these different parts. And it's the same is so. It is true of my immaterial part. I have a soul. I have a spirit. I have a heart. I have a mind. I have a conscience. I have a will. I, 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 it goes on and on. I have all these immaterial parts. But they're all immaterial. I falls into two categories. I have a material body and an immaterial part. And the soul and the spirit. Now, we know from the way these two terms are used about my immaterial being that the soul is often used with my immaterial part as it relates horizontally to this world. So the Bible talks about a soulish man. A soulish man. And the soulish man is just attached to all the carnal things of the world. And it talks about a spiritual man. And that person, the same immaterial part, instead is connected with God. It's the same immaterial being. It's the you inside. How do you inside relate to the world and how do you relate with God? And it's all in that immaterial aspect. It's not just what my body does. It's what goes on inside me that really matters. I have a soul. You have a soul the soul and the spirit that are same, focusing in two different directions. So how did you get your soul? 
All right, I understand how he did it to Adam. How did I get my soul? Well, there's a very interesting verse in the book of Genesis. It's talking about Jacob, and it says about Jacob and his descendants. He had 70 descendants in the passage that he's talking about. And it says, all the souls that came with Jacob into Egypt, which came out of his loins. Besides Jacob's sons, wives, all the souls were three score and six. Seventy souls came out of his loins. I'm, I'm going to suggest that it's by natural propagation. How did I get my body? He came out of my parents, my, my father's loins. How did I get my soul at the same time of conception? Same time of conception. I became a soul. Now this has profound implications, folks. For when does life begin? When is that person a person? It's when they have a soul. I say this has profound implications because for we as Christians, it's unbearable the thought that you would abort a living soul and not consider that murder. They're alive. They're alive. They have a soul. They have a soul. I got my soul when I was same moment I got my body, I received a soul. So where does the soul go when it dies? That's a good question. Where does your soul go when it dies? Well, there's two possibilities of where your soul goes when it dies. The first possibility is a place called Abraham's bosom. Uh, modern translations call it Abraham's side. In Luke 16, 22, uh, after this guy died, he uh, went to Abraham's King James Version says bosom. He was in the presence of Abraham in heaven. Uh, another place, you remember Jesus on the cross suffering and dying, and he says to the thief next to him, uh, who finally turns his heart and repents and believes in Jesus, he says, Jesus says to him, today you shall be with me in paradise. Paradise. It's also called paradise. There's another reference, and there's plenty of references. I mean, Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions. Okay, there's a mansion. I mean, where does the soul go when it dies? He says, you go to be with Christ. In Philippians 1, 23. Uh, he says, to be with Christ. If I die, it's to be with Christ, which is far better. So the one here is that when, when you die, you go to be with the Lord. You go to be in paradise. You go to be with Abraham and all the saints who have, have known the Lord before you. The second possibility is this. A place called Hades often translated hell, but it's different from hell. Hades is like a jail. You know, when somebody gets uh, arrested, you know, they're picked up and they're taken, uh, they put them in jail, which is a temporary holding place until they have their trial. If they're found guilty at the trial, then they go to the prison. Hades is like the jail and the lake of fire and Gehenna and a bunch of other terms that we typically would call hell is like the prison, like the prison. And so we got these two possibilities, okay? The rich man also died and was buried in Hades where he was in torment. I, I, I want to just look at this case in point that Jesus makes. You know, I'm not much of a hellfire and brimstone preacher. You know that. Jesus was. That'll get you. Jesus was. My case in point here is there was a, a, a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen, and he lived in luxury every day. Listen, I got the rich man circled up there. He's, he's got life to the full. Now, you know, the, the, the Bible says, what shall a man get, profit a man if he gains the whole world? He had gained the whole world. And he says, and at his gate there was laid a beggar whose name was Lazarus. Now, the word rich man in Latin is dives. And so he's been called dives just because it means rich man. So the dives, uh, life is great. He's profited in this world greatly. But Lazarus is a beggar. Life is tough. Life is terrible. He's covered with sores. He's longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. And even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died. And the angels carried him where? To Abraham's bosom. Wait, wait. His body is dead in the grave, 
But his soul, his spirit, is taken to heaven, and he's in Abraham's side. He's in the paradise of God. And so he said, he's at Abraham's side. The rich man also dies, and they bury his body in the ground because he's, he's dead. But that's not the end. He has a soul. And his soul, the text tells us, winds up in Hades. He's in Hades. Where he was in torment, he looked up and he saw Abraham far away and Lazarus by his side. Some consider this a parable. Some believe that it's actually Jesus' teaching uh, as it really is. Some think it's an extended story. Whatever it is, the doctrine here is very clear. Even if you take it as a parable. Beyond the grave, if you don't know the Lord, you're going to suffer and be in great pain. He sees Lazarus by his side. And so he calls out and he says, Father Abraham, have pity on me. And send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replies according to Jesus. Son, remember in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things, but now he is comforted and you are in agony. Besides all this, between us and you, is a great chasm that has been fixed so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross from over there to us. We're separate for all eternity. He answered, then I beg you, Father, Send Lazarus to my father's house. I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will never, or well, they will not also come to this place of torment. There are more evangelists in Hades than there is on planet Earth. They are more concerned for your relatives than you are. They don't want anyone to come where they are. You know, often people say, well, I, I don't care. I want to go to hell. That's where all my friends are. They don't want you there. They don't want you there. They would do anything to keep you from going there. Abraham replied, uh, they have Moses and the prophets. Whoa, we talked about Moses last week. They have the Bible. They have the Bible. Let them listen to the word of God. Let them listen to them. But he says, like a double clip, no, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. Oh, here's the whole king. You know, the, the rich man didn't go to hell or Hades because he was rich. The poor man didn't go to heaven because he was poor. Here's the key. The rich man went to Hades because he never repented. And the poor man was in heaven because he had. Repentance is the tail side of the coin. On the head side is faith. When you believe, you believe in something. When you repent, you turn from something. He had turned from the world and counted it all but loss that he might have the excellency of knowing Jesus. No, send him back because if he goes back, my brothers will repent. That's what he's saying. And he said to them, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced. Even if someone rises from the dead. Now this is almost deja vu. In a few weeks we're going to be talking about Bethany Sunday. And at Bethany is where Lazarus, who died, and Jesus raised him from the dead. And when Jesus raised him from the dead, he was on the earth. And you know what? There were still people who met him, and they did not believe. You know what they do? They wanted to kill him all the more. They wanted to kill Jesus all the more because he raised him from the dead. He's saying, listen, just because I do a miracle is not going to do it. It's just not going to do it. So what happens to the soul that goes to heaven? That's my question. What happens if the soul goes to heaven? Here we go. It's waiting the next event on God's prophetic calendar. The next prophetic event to take place is called the rapture. He says, we believe that Jesus died and rose again, so we also believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. All those in paradise, all those with Christ, all those, you see, that's gone to heaven who have died and they've known Jesus, when Jesus comes back, 
He's going to resurrect their bodies from the ground. He's going to bring those spirits and those souls. And the passage here says, he's going to bring them with them, and he says, for the Lord himself shall come down from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ, those dead bodies who have believed in Jesus, they're going to rise first, and they're going to be reunited with their souls to forever be with the Lord. That's what the text says. And if we are still alive when Jesus comes, we're going to be instantaneously changed. This body's going to put on, this corruption's going to put on incorruption, this mortal will put on immortality, and we'll be like him. That's what's going on. They're waiting in heaven for the reunion of their soul and their body. That's what they're doing. Once they're reunited, soul and body, they're going to go back into heaven and they're going to go to the judgment seat of Christ. We will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Listen. For we must all appear before the judgment of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body. The him is the soul, what you've done in your body, whether good or bad, whether good or bad. Paul tells us a little description about what's going on. He's saying it's like building a foundation. You see in your body, you're building. You're building on a foundation. You're either building on your, your faith in Christ or you're building on your lack of faith in Christ and your trust in the world, your trust in the economy, your trust in politics, your, whatever you're trusting in. You're building on something. He says no one can lay any foundation other than the one Jesus has already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, this is how he's describing by metaphor what I am doing in my life when I live for Jesus. I'm investing in that which is valuable. It has quality to what, it, what I'm doing. I'm living a life for Jesus. It's gold, silver, costly stones. But then there are those who build with wood, hay, and stubble, straw. One is very valuable and precious. I've invested my life in the eternal living for Jesus. The other one, I've lived for myself. I've gathered all this, uh, accumulated all this wealth, all this stuff, popularity, fame, fortune, all of that. And then he says this, his works will be shown for what it is because that day of Jesus Christ will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire. And the fire will test the quality of what we have done in our lives, the works of our lives. It's going to test what we have done. The fire is put to it. You know what's going to happen. If what he's built on survives, gold, silver, precious stones, the fire does nothing to it. It refines it, makes it better, removes any dross. But if it's the wood, hay, and stubble, if it's burned up, he suffers loss. If you come through that testing of what you've done with your life, and he says, oh, good, here, you get a reward. Otherwise, you suffer loss of reward. But watch what it says. He himself will be saved because he's had faith in Christ but only as escaping through fire. The fire has burned up everything. There is zero reward for eternity. Wow. So what happens to the soul in Hades? That's what happens to the soul, you know, that has accepted Christ. What happens to the soul that has rejected Christ? It's awaiting the great white throne judgment at the end of the age. John says, I saw a great white throne, and I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. Books were open. Oh. And another book was open, the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books, plural. So there's a bunch of books, and it's recording everything you're doing. I don't know, maybe it's on video by now. I don't know. It's all written down. Everything you've done in your whole life, it's written down in heaven. It's recorded. And they're judged according to two books. The one book is the book, the plural, books. All the deeds you've done in your life. And the other one is the book of life. And the sea gave up its dead that were in it. And the death in Hades, hell itself, Hades, the jail gives up everybody that's in it to go before the judge, Jesus, on the throne. And Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done in the books. You see, your life, your body matters. What you're doing in your ma body matters. You're going to give an account for it. He goes on and he says, 
Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. A separation from God for all eternity. Like Hades, it's just now the permanent situation. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, oh, the book of life is there to see. No mistakes. Did you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior? Your name is written down in the book. There's going to be no mistakes. If anyone's name was not found written in that book of life, he's the one that was cast into the lake of fire. The one who rejects. The one that rejects. Brings me back to the two powerful questions. All of this, I just do. I, I want, imagine Jesus is standing here looking you in the eye and Jesus asks you, what is, the, what is the use in gaining the whole world? What is the use in gaining the whole world? And then he looks at you and he says, what can you give? in exchange for your soul. What are you going to get? The answer is nothing. I do a lot of funerals. I did one this last week. You know, in all the funerals I've done, I've never ever once seen the hearse with a U-Haul trailer behind it because they were taking something with them. You leave everything behind. What will it gain? What does it profit you if you gain the whole world? but you've lost your soul. That's what Jesus is asking. What can you give in exchange for your soul? And the answer is nothing. Why is it nothing? Why can't I give anything in exchange for my soul? It's because you just can't. And Jesus already has done everything necessary for the exchange of your soul. You say, what are you talking about? In Isaiah 53, where it says, we've all sinned, we've all like sheep gone astray, we've turned everyone to his own way, we're doing our own thing, we're sinning. It says then that the Lord laid on him the iniquity, the sin of us all. Jesus suffered and he died. If you read past, down a little bit further in that passage, just four verses later, it says this, and it was the Lord's will to crush him. The innocent one. Jesus was crushed, nailed to the cross, pounded in the flesh. His, his hands were crushed with the nails. And he was put to grief here it is, when his soul makes an offering. His soul. Jesus died as a substitute, his soul, for your soul. His soul was made an offering for your guilt, for the guilty, for the guilty. He took your place. You see, what you need is a confident assurance that my name is written down in the book of life. The only way that comes is through a genuine expression of faith where you call upon the name of the Lord and say, like, like Peter, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are my Savior and my Lord. Let's pray.